Welcome, good afternoon, good evening. My name is Alexandra Terry. I'm the chief curator at the Museum of Contemporary Art Santa Barbara. Uh, we are so delighted to have with us today Genevieve Gagnard, Tina Perry Whitney, and Rick Whitney. This is the first edition of our new series that we're calling Collector Series. And really it's just an exploration into collecting contemporary art from as many perspectives as we can incorporate. So for those of you who are interested in beginning to collect, for those of you who have always wondered what it entails, and for those of you who have already started collecting but are interested in exploring new avenues and um, getting tips and tricks or just hearing from other collectors and artists, that's what we're hoping to achieve. Uh, so if you, I just, you know, quick shout out for the museum. If you're not subscribed to our newsletter, please do so, so that you can find out about upcoming events such as this. Um, visit us at mcasantabarbara.org and you can join our newsletter there. So let's get down to it because we have a lot to talk about. I'm just going to give a brief bio for our guests. Uh, Genevieve Gagnard is a Los Angeles-based artist whose work focuses on photographic self-portraiture, sculpture, and installation to explore race, femininity, class, and their various intersections. The daughter of a Black father and white mother, Gagnard's youth was marked by a strong sense of invisibility. Was her family white enough to be white, Black enough to be Black? Gagnard interrogates notions of passing in an effort to address these questions. She positions her own female body as the chief site of exploration, challenging viewers to navigate the powers and anxieties of intersectional identity. Gagnard received her MFA in photography at Yale University and her BFA in photography at Massachusetts College of Art. She has exhibited throughout the United States and her exhibition at the Museum of Contemporary Art Santa Barbara entitled Outside Looking In, unfortunately just came down. Hopefully, if you weren't able to visit the exhibition in person, you have visited our website to see the installation images. And there is also an exhibition walkthrough on our YouTube channel. Tina Perry Whitney was named president of OWN, the Oprah Winfrey Network in 2019, overseeing all operations and creative areas of the network and reporting to chairman and CEO Oprah Winfrey. Her leadership drives the force behind the network's ongoing evolution to become the leading destination for Black audiences and oversees OWN's digital division, including the Watch OWN app and its growing podcast business. Perry has a passion for art and serves on the California Institute of the Arts Board of Trustees, the Stanford University's Cantor Arts Center Advisory Board, and is a founding member of the Mistake Room. And Rick Whitney is a seasoned media executive whose experience has placed him at the forefront of media and entertainment's tre tremendous digital growth. He has served in several capacities across media, entertainment, and technology companies firmly planted in the Hollywood, Silicon Valley, and Madison Avenue trifecta. Rick currently owns and operates two media and entertainment entities, curation and sound sculpture. Rick serves on the board of directors at Lax Art and Friends of Levitt Pavilion. Thank you all again for being here. Sorry I, if I breeze through that, um, but everybody's bios are up on our website if you'd like to learn more about them. So I just wanted us to have a conversation today. Uh, Rick and Tina generously lent works of Genevieve's to our exhibition Outside Looking In. And I got to learn a bit more about their relationship. Um, and I just, I know that Genevieve has a very special relationship with many of her collectors. And so I thought this would be a great starting point. Um, but first I wanted to ask Rick and Tina, what, what led you to start collecting artwork and, and when did you make your first acquisition? Yeah, well, I think we, we both have two different stories that kind of converge, maybe uh, I'll tell yours. And yeah, I had, you know, had a passion for art and then I saw a show in the UK when I was studying over there. It was Sensations, the Charles Saatchi exhibition about contemporary art back in the 90s. And that really turned me on to contemporary art. I knew I just had a passion for it. I'd hoped to collect, but didn't know remotely how that would happen. 
And fast forward, I spent time in New York where the barriers to entry felt very high to even really participate or figure out how to collect. And then I moved to LA where it was just the scene was emerging and I had the opportunity to engage, figure out, collecting, meet people who had a passion to. And fortunately I met him. Uh, he had the same passion I did for the arts and contemporary art, which made it really easy for us to both jump feet first into it. Uh, but that's kind of my, my quick answer for my journey of like, where the where it, you know the match was struck for me. Yeah, I think for me, I grew up in Memphis, uh, Tennessee, and spent some time in Chicago post undergrad before going to, coming to LA for grad school. And throughout those time, I went to museums, uh, you know, saw a few gallery shows in Chicago, but I wasn't deeply into the arts. I was just interested, and, and obviously had no real understanding of uh, collecting or even you know the, the true nature of uh, patronage. But um, when I moved to LA for grad school, I ended up in downtown LA. And at that particular period, this is early 2000, maybe 2002, 2003, uh, there were quite a few artists that lived downtown. So I befriended people, hung out, a lot of drinking buddies. And through that, I ended up um, acquiring my first piece, a uh, commission from a, a friend of mine who's an artist, and kind of grew from there. So I think even when we first met and you know, started dating, we had the chance and you know I think I don't even think we really talked about art on our first few dates but when she came over my place she noticed that I had art on the wall and that became a, a from there came a, a discussion point I think one of our earlier dates was to uh certainly an art show which one was it, it was um, um I mean I remember Pacific Standard yeah, Time, Pacific Standard Time. yeah that mean, was one I remember yeah. asking if you wanted to go to an art event at someone's house and I think it was the Brentwood Canyons um, you know, a big art collector house, and I had no idea what he was going to say. And we walked in, and uh, he knew a few of the works on the wall. So I, at that point, I was like, "Whoa, this might be a keeper." <laughs> that's imp that's impressive. It doesn't always happen that, first of all, you can even talk about your passion for collecting art, but to already have such a passion that you kind of brought into your relationship—that's awesome. Um, and Genevieve, I, I kind of wanted to start by asking you how, you know, what do you remember about the first artworks of yours that you sold? And, you know, as, a, as an emerging artist, there's often this kind of question about how am I gonna start selling work and how do I, what channels do I go through? So what do you remember about that? And how did that experience shape your understanding of what it meant to work with collectors? Yeah, oddly enough, I think um, Rick and Tina are, some of my first collectors. Um, I had my thesis show at uh, Diane Rosenstein and um, like some of my classmates, like we all kind of just lingered and like thought like, okay, this is our like sort of connection to the art world. Let's see if this can turn into anything. Um, and I don't even think I had to show up when they saw the work, but there was there were some pieces that Diane had, and they they can probably tell their story better of like interacting, like how they stumbled across the piece that they ended up with at first. But um, and even the way I found out about it, we kind of crossed paths at a different opening at Diane's, and they were like, very like these two people like very warmly looking at me, and I was just like, hi, I don't know, like I hadn't heard about the that they had acquired it yet. So I was all like, oh, cool, thank you. I, I don't know what's happening. <laughs> so, you know, just right from the beginning, I felt like, you know, looking at me like I was almost part of the family, you know, in a, in a funny way. And so just that kind of early on, like when you feel like someone gets the work, not just because it's the in thing, but they actually have a connection to the piece is when it feels like the most special. Yeah, and it's a great story about the piece. Um, you know, we had been at the gallery and you know, she had been showing us a lot of different work and she opened up this drawer and wanted to show us this one last piece before we left and it was Genevieve's piece. And it was this beautiful collage on this kind of matte gold paper and it's, um, you know, she's in it physically. And um, it's just this beautiful, stunning piece. And we, at that time when we were collecting we're just figuring out like when you have that feeling, right? When you're like, oh wow, this piece talks to me. Tell me more about the artist. 
it's not just like a visual, a visual reaction, but like you are seeing something deeper in the piece. And um, we found that it was a very early piece she had made, you know, right after school or during, we weren't exactly sure when, but it was very early on in her practice. Yeah, and it was one where, you know, to Tina's point, we, we saw the work and we're like, oh, wow, of all the things that Diane had shown us, that was the one that spoke to us most. And to a certain degree, it was kind of an afterthought for Diane, because I don't think she was thinking that we would be interested in that respect, but that was the one that we wanted to acquire. And that was our introduction to, you know, Genevieve as an artist. And I think from there, we had a chance to see more of her photographic work. Um, we're able to acquire some of the individual photos that she, that she did early on. And that progressed to uh, some of the, the serial uh, photo works. Um, we have a, a video work that, that Genevieve also created. And yeah, it's kind of just blossomed from there. I mean, I think you know, she's obviously one of our uh, most favorite artists. Yes. And one, one last thing I'll say is that, you know, some galleries who've represented her have seen the work. Um, they've come over and seen our collection and they've seen it. And it's very interesting their reaction because when they see the work, you know, they know her work and her so intimately well, they see all these elements in this piece that they've never seen before, but still resonates in her practice. So they always like stand over and they're deconstructing it. And they're like, wow, she made this win. And they can see how she still carries on a lot of themes and ideas and notions she was working through with that piece. So that was really gratifying for us kind of to see that experience because for us, it was just the beginning of the journey, but for people that had worked with her, they saw something so much deeper, yeah. That's what's nice when uh, collectors will collect an artist deep and like kind of keep returning to, um, you know, see the evolution of their practice and then uh, exactly to go into someone's house and see all of those things, but see that they're very connected like, you know, some artists might make a big shift, but um, it's like, I'm really re like into creating the collage works more so recently and to think back and, you know, I was in a photo program and I was making collage works and some, you know, and crazy shoes and all sorts of things. And I think the shoes were what Diane was trying to push you guys on, but um, <laughs> that, you know, just to kind of say that like, that was part of my practice from very early on. And so a lot of folks would be like, oh, so you started doing other things other than photo, but it's, it's kind of like, no, I've kind of done it all along. <laughs> yeah. I, I think, you know, you mentioned alone, that was one of the things that also drew us into your work, the, the, your, your practice in terms of how you actually execute it. And I think once we, we had the chance to meet you and talk more about the way you worked, I think for us, the, the labor part of, of art is also really intriguing. And, you know, I think there's, sounds kind of weird, but I think there's a, um, there's a way that the work sort of emanates and, you know, people are putting a lot of uh, blood, sweat and tears in what they create, a lot of time, a lot of energy. And you often don't see that in the final product. But, you know, once you get the chance to know the artist and understand what they put behind it, I think there is an element where you start to see, okay, wow, there's, it's much deeper than just something you're looking at. Yeah, one last thing I'll just say is, we realized really early, early on with Genevieve, um, as we started to collect deeper and deeper with her, like she puts a lot of, like, she's a deep thinker, right? And she's put a lot of thought behind the work she's making, the why, the intentionality. And that really resonated, I think, with us because um, as we continued to buy, and we kept hearing about why and seeing the work and watching it, it just makes the work more powerful and just drew us in more. And I wanted to ask this of, of both, well, of all of you really, but you know, it's clear that there's a real reciprocal relationship. You know, Genevieve, you're close to a lot of your collectors and Rick and Tina, it's clear that you also have this real feeling of, um, responsibility in a way towards the artists that you're collecting. Um, and so maybe you can tell us a bit more about why that relationship is important to you. You know, often we call collectors collectors, but really the ideas around patronage and them being a patron to the artists. And it sounds like you're working in a true methodology of patronage, which is watching Genevieve's work as it evolves and 
it feels to me that Genevieve has a relationship like that with many collectors who follow your career, Genevieve, and, and are really interested in your evolution as an artist. Yeah, well, I'll start. I think that a big piece of it for uh, what we've seen with Genevieve is that, you know, as much as she's known for her photographic work, I mean, she does have a wide swath of, um, of work she's, she's pulled together. And I think there is something about her being able to express that creativity and you know whether it's you know whether we met her coming straight out of school or we happened you know upon her poster for the museum show i think for collectors it's really doesn't matter what their entry point is it's really more just what is the draw to the artist is there something personally that you have connected to them and in our case i think it's just more special that a lot of the work that we collect are living artists and there's something about the notion of what Genevieve is capturing now in you know, what's considered the contemporary world that we think is timeless. We think the, the narratives behind, uh, behind race, uh, behind uh, feminism, behind certainly being a, a photographer and having a wide swath of uh, abilities or something that is going to uh, really showcase itself over time. It's not just a particular moment. I think it's also important for us to hear from artists their voice, um, what the work means to them. You know, you can buy a piece of work and interpret what you want. You can read on the page or hear from the galleries, but we have just taken so much from artists when we get to hear from them. Um, and we've been rather surprised at the number of artists that are kind of shocked, like we want to do a Zoom or meet them or hear. We have always assumed that every collector wants to know all the artists in their collection if you can to get to hear them hear from them about the work that you bought, but that's not, we realize always the case. For some reason, it's just not a part of some people's collecting practice, but for us, we really um, relish that opportunity to get to hear from them because it's important when we talk about the work to other people that it's properly represented. And we also want to experience the work in the way the artist intended. And there's so many like ways that collectors collect and, Rick and Tina specifically, like you go into the house and it's like, it's it, you're immersed in all of it. Like it feels like it goes with the furniture. Do you know, it, it all is like in conversation and there really isn't like an empty space for, you're just like, oh, you're still collecting. Okay, where is it gonna go? <laughs> and I'm sure, you know, people like switch things out and whatnot, but, um, and then I think maybe there's a little bit that some collectors don't want to have that relationship because it really isn't about that. It's like an investment that they're going to like flip over, you know, something, which I get, like, there's so many different um, sides to it. Um, and honestly, I don't know if I could be friends with every single collector, you know, it'd be a lot, <laughs> but um, just that feeling of like support even if they're, you know, with each show, even if they're not gonna buy it, it's like, I want them to see it so that they can see like the growth. It's almost like you wanna like, I don't know, have their approval on, or just their encouraging words on like the next, the next body of work. And just to hear them say that they look for that is, you know, means a lot. I think that's a really good point too. With your work, we've seen a maturation and, you know, I think, you don't necessarily know where an artist is going to take things, but like you're saying, we've seen every one of your shows and, you know, you know, obviously you, know, you can't buy everything, but I think there's something about when we see something like, oh, wow, that's amazing. And whether we acquire it or not, it's just one, you know, just another additive piece in terms of why we love you as an artist, because we can literally see, oh yeah, she's, she's figured something out. And yeah. there's a continued conversation that we're obviously certainly in tune with. Yeah. And I think, you know, we talk a lot to other people who want to collect or new collectors about how to do it, how to approach it, you know, fears they may have. And Genevieve's a great artist in our collection that we can talk about our journey with her. And, you know, from the first moment that we just described to you guys to like her last show, and what we loved about it and just, you know, how that really feels to, to be a part of an artist's like, like, you know, path, their whole journey like watching and staying close and just there's such a gratification you feel um you know with the work but also just so happy for the artist you know especially if there's someone like Genevieve that's just had a beautiful trajectory um but like Rick said a maturation 
um, that's just been pretty amazing. Well, and I hope you don't mind me saying, but you know, as Genevieve mentioned, you really live with your artwork. And when, when Sarah, our exhibitions manager and I came to collect the work, it was installed in your, in your home in, in a way that it was clear that you are living with the work. It's not, um, it's really a part of your every day. And I think that's, that's really beautiful. And, and you both have mentioned that in previous interviews that it's, you know, you're living with the work. It's a part of your everyday experience. And so I'm curious about how you feel that your collection reflects your own sensibilities because Tina, you've also mentioned that, you know, many of the artists whose work you've purchased have social commentary woven throughout their work. And I wonder if you, you uh, find yourselves drawn to work that reflects your own social um, ideals or notions or even that of your community. Before we answer that, I just want to say one thing. I know he's going to laugh at this. So when you guys came to take the work, um, I wasn't here, I know. I think you were here. Yeah. And I knew you guys were coming any day now. You're going to come. It may have even gotten pushed today. And I like came home and I was like, oh, I was like, it's gone. I was like, I wasn't ready for it. I was like, and he was like, yeah, I've been telling you forever. And I was like, it was just like so, because we had been living with it so long. And it yeah. just, you know, you live with this work and it becomes a part of you. And it's like, you know, you go through a stressful day, but you come into rooms where like, it's comforting, do you yeah. know what I mean? And and then COVID hit yeah. and we didn't have anything in the wall, but the, what are they called? I keep the cleats. Talking. The cleats. Yeah, the cleats were there for a while. And so during yeah. COVID, we were so happy it was in the show. Yeah. And it, of course we would, you know what I mean? It was just such an honor, yeah. but all through COVID we're just like, yeah. oh my gosh, anything we would do to have this work back on this wall to be able to look at it during COVID because we just missed it. So I just have to say that because that was like a funny, small little anecdote of like- Well, that's, it's so funny because I, I feel like Sarah and I were packing the work and Sarah's like, should we put something else in its place? Because it did, it, it felt like a hole in the space. It was, it, was a, it, was a, it was that one of the particular works were in a primary space in our, in our home. And yeah, and Tina's right, I mean, it, COVID happened shortly thereafter because, you know, even, you know, you guys had to postpone the show, but a closer show. That said, we didn't replace it. And, you know, it, it took us months until things got a little more safe where we could even, you know, have some one come in and help us hang something else. All right. But it's just mm -hmm. funny. Do you want to jump yeah. in on the social commentary question? Or? Uh, yeah. I mean, I think, you know, for us, we look at contemporary art as a snapshot or a, a lens into a particular moment. And... You know, we started collecting about, oh my gosh, maybe seven, eight years ago. So, you know, you're talking, you know, 2012, 2013, however you want to look at it. And there were certain things happening in the world. And I think by nature, by as a by, byproduct of that, there were artists having a particular conversation. And that particular conversation was very important to us. And, you know, I think if you were to you know, fast forward X amount of years, we think that the work that these artists are doing now would be a very good uh, representation of what was happening in this particular moment. And we've been drawn to that work. Um, you know, some of the work is, 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 is more powerful and, you know, maybe a bit more difficult to, to live with in that respect. But again, we think it fits the particular moment. And hopefully over time, that also shifts. There may be something five years from now that, you know, that becomes more of a interesting conversation piece. And that's where a lot of the work that we may be acquiring sort of draws from. Right. And I think that's true with respect to kind of social commentary or pro-social conversations. But, you know, I think it also are some people that aren't having it. You know, there's some ceramics that we started to collect five years ago, four years or four or five years ago that we're working with ceramics in a really unique, different way. And we've gone really deep on them. And, you know, ceramics is now having a renaissance, you know what I mean? But, you know, it was when it started four or five years ago, like, it was just beginning where people were starting to think about it differently again, right? And so I think there's something about that. I don't think we're seeking it out, but there is something about in the moment, reflective of the time, you know, um, but I can't tell you that we are looking for artists that like are making those statements. What we find is like, you'll see work. We try to see as much as possible as everyone else shows and Instagram and you name it. And you find work that you may read about and then it touches you. And then when you talk to the artist, you may find there's something else there that you can't even see. And so it just kind of started just to attract us like a magnet, I think we realized. 
And, and that leads me to a question that I wanted to ask Genevieve about, you know, social commentary and, and, and uh, social justice concerns. And, you know, Genevieve, you have been a very outspoken advocate for collectors of color, specifically for black color collectors. And um, at the Freeze Art Fair in LA, I guess almost this time last year, you wore a dress at the opening and on the back it said sell to black collectors. And you also had a piece at your solo presentation at the Veal Matter Los Angeles booth. And I wonder if you can talk to us more about what spurred you to take that action and what kind of relationships you had been building with your collectors in the time before that, that really kind of gave you that platform. Yeah, um, I think, it was just that like over time of just like becoming closer um, to my collectors, specifically like my collectors of color who have like really taken me under their wing and like all the black collectors are like all like buddies and friends. So like, it's kind of like, we're all like moving and shifting in the same circle. Um, and for those of us that are closer, like we share, stories like about our experiences with galleries or like vice versa their experiences with galleries and so um just like kind of hearing those stories and I'm not like the only artist that have, has kind of addressed this issue um but I think I had just gotten to a point in my career and I had that platform to like have a solo booth at Freeze um where it felt like the right time to kind of make this statement and it honestly started with just the the collage with the statement on it um and to be honest i was a little nervous like how people would respond to this um but that's when i think you know like the work is powerful um and i just kind of amped it up a little bit more i was literally painting the dress like the the night before um and I was like, okay, look, we're gonna turn this into a performance piece as well. And yeah, I guess I'm just asking questions with these statements. You know, what does it mean? Does, do people even think that this is an issue? And I, I did get some, you know, some feedback that people were like, this isn't an issue. And it's like, well, then you're not talking to the right people, you know? So I don't know. Yeah. If that's okay. I think we just wanna jump in and say, you know, we didn't know Genevieve was gonna do that performance and but we saw it and when it was written about and as black collectors um I can't tell you how glad we were to see the conversation we were people were having about it because some people think it's not an issue but if you're not a black collector you may not know it um and it's they don't you know you have to experience it where you know um some people use different or tactical and may make it a little more difficult than you can imagine sometimes to collect pieces um, if you're a black collector, we've experienced that for sure, coast to coast, um, with different places, not every gallery at all. Um, but you can pair stories and you can hear, or you talk to non-black collectors going after the same work at the same gallery at the same time, because collectors don't know who your friends are. And you just he hear how tr differently you're being treated, or you may even know the artist and the gallerist doesn't know you actually already have the artist's work, or you know the artist and you can tell they're not maybe being above board or honest with you about things. And those experiences have been difficult for us. Um, but Jenny, they, you know, we've never even told you this, like when you did that performance piece, it meant a lot to us as black collectors knowing the challenges we faced at the time. Yeah. And I would add to that, you know, patronage comes in many forms. And I think the art collecting aspect of it is just one sliver, but it's a, to a certain degree, it's a very privileged Sliver. And I think with that privilege comes a lot of responsibility, but at the same time, I think some of that may not necessarily open itself up to a lot of the, the discussion points about who has access. And, you know, it, it is a situation where it's not always about financial means. It's about uh, who someone chooses to, to have access. And I think that's one of the aspects, particularly when you're uh, talking about Black collectors or talking about artists of color, where their work may not have had the opportunity to live with or be acquired by uh, collectors of color, or you don't see artists of color in, in museums, uh, or they're not supported by certain galleries. So I think 
yes, there's been some growth in that. And a lot of it comes from that conversation. So I think the fact that Genevieve was pushing that conversation at Freeze last year only can help continue this and hopefully make some sort of changes. Right. I will say the number of white collector friends we have who are surprised by our experiences, it, I mean, it's almost all of us. Like they could never imagine. And when we tell the stories in detail and nuances, they're like appalled because they're like, I've never had this experience. I can't imagine it's happening to you in London happening to you in New York, happening to you in LA. And, you know, it'd be different if those close friends were saying, oh, it happened to me too, but it's not. So thank you for starting that conversation because I think people are a little more aware now. And I think some galleries are now thinking just about maybe their action and practices differently. And I'll quickly add too, I think one of the, the pluses of having a partner who uh, is supportive in, in the art in, in the same, in same vein is that you have another sounding board. Because mm -hmm. there's certainly been situations where things have happened and I had a POV that may be a little bit different than her POV, mm -hmm. or we had a chance to discuss it. And that gave us, okay, wait a minute, we are on the same page here. Mm -hmm. And, you know, even situations where I may have been a little bit more taken aback or she, been, or she may have been more taken aback. So I think that balance also, you know, breathes really well as it relates to sort of dealing with some of the issues and really trying to navigate a space that's often quite foreign for people, particularly when they weren't you know, kind of born into it or had a lot of experience prior to it. Yeah, and I will say that for a few gallerists that um, that type of experience happened for us, there have been a few where it turned into a learning experience for them. And we not yeah. only collected work at that moment, we continue to support them as gallerists and buy from them deeply and become really good friends. So I definitely want to stress that too, that is not turned into every single time we're like, we're just not buying from you and walking away, right? It has been an experience where some of them maybe just didn't realize or understand. And, you know, it's been a really beautiful relationship with them as, as, as gallerists and collectors. I also wanted to add that, you know, for my short period of time being here, like six years here in LA, um, and just the continued growth in the relationships with my collectors and them advocating for me and like showing up for me that like, by the time freeze came around it felt like you know this is my time to kind of you know advocate on their behalf and again like they didn't ask me to do that but um it just felt like a, a pressing issue to address as you said genevieve you know you're not there are other artists who are being quite vocal about about these concerns and, you know, a lot of artists are very um, active with their gallerists and whoever their dealers are with regard who they, you know, with who they want to sell work to. So some artists are pretty insistent that they want their work to go to institutions so that it can be continued to be seen by the public. And I think Deborah Roberts is, is one of those artists. And I know Rick and Tina, you have work by Deborah and, um, you know, it's really important to her that her work is in public institutions so that people that she feels she's representing through her work can benefit from being in relationship to it rather than it specifically going to someone's home and, and, and not being on view publicly. And Genevieve, I mean, that was just one of the most public platforms that you could choose to do that. And, you know, there's so much critique and, and questioning around Freeze and who is Freeze for and what has it become. And it was so beautiful because you had this amazing solo presentation, which just received an, a, a wonderful amount of attention, rightly so, for really bold and beautiful work. And then for you to take that extra step. And I just love some of the you know documentation of your performance specifically you moving throughout the fair and being photographed in other gallery booths really to drive the the point home and i wonder genevieve do you feel other than receiving feedback from your collectors and people that you're in community with do you feel that you received feedback or read press that you felt like maybe there this action will kind of lead to more awareness around this I mean, definitely. It's just, it's just that like the pandemic kind of shut things down in a, in a certain way. And so, you know, people will hopefully like held on to that message, but at the same time, you know, the world was kind of crumbling in other ways. 
So um, I recently got asked, you know, what what's something I hope changes in the next year in the art world. And I was just kind of flat out said, I don't think that selling to black collectors that it got addressed, you know, during the year of, you know, COVID. So um, I'm still, I'm still championing that message. Um, so that's kind of where I'm, you know, I think there's so much to unpack there and, you know, time for folks to reflect and, you know, kind of like, you know, Tina said, it's not going to like happen overnight. And, um, you know, folks need to like have that moment of like, catching themselves in that or being called out on something specific to really um, have that change start to happen. But And Genevieve, you're also, you know, you really also advocate for other artists of color. And you had this amazing residency at the Massachusetts College of Liberal Arts over the summer and during the pandemic, which was able to shift in ways that I think was really impactful. And you curated an exhibition entitled We Are More Than a Moment. And We Are More Than a Moment was also one of the works that you exhibited at the Vilmetter Los Angeles um, uh, booth. And I wonder if you can talk about your experience curating the exhibition and, and what the impetus for the exhibition was. Yeah, I think the message of We Are More Than a Moment kind of tied in with the resurgence of Black Lives Matter and just kind of I think it's all, you know, when these things die down, like people think like, oh, it's not happening anymore. And it's like, no, these stories are still happening. And we're not just these particular moments, we're like so much more. And so um, through the residency that, you know, it was kind of required that I would already like curate something, hoping that I would be able to figure that out. Um, but yeah, so it was kind of op open to interpretation I didn't want to like exclude folks, but I wanted to kind of express that I wanted a lot of um, artists of color to feel open to applying to that. And it was really hard to cut folks out because there was a lot of great work. So it was a big show of 40 artists and um, yeah, it was pretty powerful. And even like during that, that time, it was like people weren't really sure how to do online openings and things like that and like these artists showed up and they were so excited we had a DJ and like we didn't really know what to expect but it just like the energy was so lovely and it just kind of felt like okay we can still do this even if it doesn't feel like it used to. I was so um first of all, grateful to be a part of the many conversations that you had throughout your residency, but really I was in awe of the ability that you had to create the sense of community digitally. And there were these weekly conversations with you and Erica Wall, who's the director of the program and the curator of, the, of Gallery 51. And um, I mean, I just felt like I looked forward to those conversations so much because the sense of community was so strong and there was so much grieving going on because of all of the global events that we were facing at the time. And it was just so beautiful that your ability to curate that community came through so strongly online and, and through the screen. And I just think that it was so impactful. It was great. And even some of the folks that were in it continued to reach out and I would show up to different things that they were having. So it meant a lot that, you know, they were showing up for me and it's just like this kind of constant back and forth. And that's also how it is with the collectors, you know, whether it's just like dialogue around ideas for future works or just, you know, just having a tough time. It's, it's kind of like people showing up for each other is the energy I'm trying to attract. <laughs> Well, um, I wanted to ask Rick and Tina about the boards that you sit on because you're both, in addition to being collectors, you're both very active 
on boards of arts institutions, which is again, another form of patronage. And I'd, I'd love to hear from you and how that kind of came about, how you started getting engaged and, and, and joining these posts and how you feel that um, these roles on boards also impacts your relationship to artists. Um, you know, the mistake room was the first experience for me. Um, you know, I was so fortunate to be asked to be a part of that board um, right when it was getting started. So I'm a founding board member. And um, I learned a lot about the art world and about artists and about etiquette in it, as well as uh, just the LA art community by helping build that institution, that space. Um, Cesar Garcia also who leads it, became a very good friend. Um, to us and, you know, just, I learned so much from those early days participating on that board. Um, Cal Arts came along for me a little later and that was just such a privilege also to be able to be on a art school board, you know, um, for us people who are creative are just so important to our culture and society. And it's such a gift to get to live with the work that people, you know, make. Um, and whether that's music, whether that's um, art, um, or dance performance, it's a privilege for all of us because it makes all of our lives better. And we just felt strongly about supporting the Institute and, and making sure that pipeline continues. Um, you know, creativity and imagination is such an important part of the work we do working in entertainment and media. And it's, it's you know, one of the most important traits you need to make it in the industry. And so it's just such a natural extension for us to like support spaces and institutes and places like that, that, that value it also. Um, and then the Cantor Museum, you know, I'm a graduate of Stanford and I was just honored, you know, they're going through some transition and um, kind of growing that board and, and the museum itself. So I was fortunate to get to grow that, I mean, be a part of that. Um, it's a newer experience for me, but it's really been um, a great experience. So for us, it's at least for me, and I think both of us, it's, you know, collecting is one way to be a patron and support the arts, but you also support it when you go to museums, you support it when you go to a show. You support it if you decide to serve on a board or give a donation. Um, you know, you bring somebody to an event, you're supporting it. And I think for us, it's a 360 experience, um, you know, supporting the arts. And uh, it's just has really enriched, um, I think, just our journey. So, yeah. yeah. I mean, as I mentioned before, I mean, patronage is reflected in myriad ways. So, you know, the, the board participation, uh, the, the nonprofit side is just one of those pillars. And we've been very fortunate that we've had the opportunity to you know, participate in that respect. Um, you know, Tina mentioned the mistake room. You know, I think I was sort of a de facto yeah. mistake room board member, which yes. I think is also a beautiful part of it is that, you know, as a, as a family, we're able to participate across, you know, there's really no, uh, no lines. It's, it's all sort of blurred. Um, and then I think for me personally, uh, being a board member on LAX Art, it started when Hamza Walker uh, came over and took over the organization. And I, been long impressed with his, you know, art mm -hmm. knowledge and uh, perspective, curatorial ability, and you know, after having a chance to sit down and meet with him, I was more than excited to, you know, participate on his his board, his organization, and again, it's just one of those things where, you know, you want to do what you can, particularly for these organizations that are close to home, and I think Los Angeles has long had a very rich arts history, and the cool part I think for us, which you know, we didn't necessarily know all of this history because we, we started collecting and, and, and growing in our patronage later. But you know, we having some of the conversations, we knew that a lot of artists and a lot of people left Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. They went to New York, they went international. And I think it's been cool to see more of these people kind of quote unquote stay home. Mm -hmm. And you know, consequently, we've seen just the opportunities and the sort of the profile of Los Angeles as a arts community grow. And you know, for us, I think any aspect that we can help, you know, continue that has been wonderful. Well, I think all of you are are doing that. You know, really make. I mean, I've been in Santa Barbara for a little over five years, and I I just having this connection, being close to Los Angeles, and seeing the shifts and changes that have happened over the few years. But I'm just really grateful to you, Rick and Tina, as collectors, and you, Genevieve course as an artist for really contributing such deep work and and you know taking taking the the work into your own hands and supporting each other and 
Um, I'm mind, I want to be mindful of time, and I just want to say if anyone has any questions, please type them into the chat box. We can um, answer some of those questions. But I, I kind of wanted to wrap up, I guess, on a lighter note, just to ask all of you if you had to give one piece of advice. So, you know, you, Genevieve, if, if you had to give advice to emerging or early career artists, um, who are beginning to work with, you know, dealers or commercial organizations around selling your work. Is there something that you learned through your journey with collectors and with galleries that you would, you know, something that you'd like to pass on to younger artists? Um, definitely. I would say, you know, early on, it's hard to like understand that you have more control or more say over where things end up. And we're just trying to like, make a sale honestly to kind of be part of that world um so you're not really maybe as concerned where your work is going but over time you will come to that realization and you know if you if you take this advice early then you can get there sooner but um that you really do have a say of where your work goes um and and that doesn't mean that you know, my work is with someone that I don't necessarily want it to be with, but it's just being able to realize that you, you can advocate for yourself and where the works go. Um, and, and consider the people that are showing up for you and in your corner as people that you want to like, you know, help acquire works and, um, just, you know, don't over, don't overthink it, but um, when those when those folks that are stepping up for you and showing up for you um, are having these issues of of acquiring work, then I think it it's you've got to start those conversations with your with your galleries, um, just to, you know just so they know what you what you want. You got to kind of guide them because they're just kind of working on the way that they're used to working, and um, some artists are very removed from that process at all. So it's really in their hands to do those things. But if you want to be more present and be, you know, fuller, a fuller part of the journey of your work and where it ends up, then just to be kind of aware to start those conversations early. Well, and I can imagine that those conversations could feel quite scary early on. Like, as you said, I think a lot of younger artists maybe feel that they don't, they can't advocate for themselves. And so I think that advice is really important. You know, our relationship working on the exhibition, I felt so, I felt like this great back and forth between us and that it was very generative. And I've said this before, I learned so much from you. And, you know, for me, the curatorial relationship with the artist is, is I, you know, I, I'm here to learn and I'm here to serve and I'm here to support. And I loved that we were able to have this back and forth. And I think, you know, I, obviously I don't know what your relationship with your galleries is, but from what I've seen, it's, it's similar. You have that very similar relationship with collectors, with your gallery, with the curators you're working with. And I think that's really admirable example because it can be, it can feel like you're not able to have that presence or take that responsibility to take your career and decisions into your own hands yeah and I think it's you know it's a lot to do with like personality too because it's like some some people just want to like I just make the work and just you guys get it to where it needs to go and they're just they're better they feel better just working in that way but I started to just feel like this is like a full, like a bigger picture me having like a voice and having kind of my own kind of business or whatever, you know, like it's my own, this is how I make my money. This is how I put food on my plate, you know? So those things felt like they, like I needed to be at least involved in a conversation around them. I don't have to make every single decision, but like just being informed is, is kind of huge for me. <laughs> and so Rick and Tina, I wonder, I mean, Tina, you said earlier that you have friends or people who have come to you and asked advice about how to begin collecting or how to, you know, take certain steps in, a, in, in specific directions. So if there's a piece of advice that you would be willing to share here, that would be great. 
Yeah, I think my piece of advice would be, you know, go to talks, sign up for Zooms. If you, you know, when the world opens up, you can go by a show for 10 minutes before you go to a dinner, do you know what I mean? But go, go to museums and it doesn't have to always be the opening night. Like just go see as much as you can. And also it doesn't have to just be like one type of thing you go see. I encourage people to expand their horizons of like, looking at, you know, if you think you want to collect X, don't be afraid to go to the show or an opening about Y, right? Because you may pick up something there or see something there, even if it's not the artist themselves that influences you. I might also say along those lines, you know, um, the art world is really friendly, at least the LA art world. I mean, I think the art world overall really is. When you're at events, people are pretty friendly. And we have found that at events, we've met some collectors who random conversation started and we got along great. And then next thing you know, we're going to an event they're holding. And I wanna stress the notion about going to events at different different types of events, even if it's not the exact type of art you love. Um, we had the privilege of uh, meeting Bob Rennie, um, who's a collector out of Vancouver at a museum event in LA and became friendly with him and ended up going to an event in Vancouver he held. And you know, just seeing his collection, talking with him, hearing him talk about his art, left an impression on us, you know, in so many ways. We took away so much from just seeing him. And, you know, we have definitely different collection patterns. He's collected for a very long time, has an unbelievable collection. But I encourage you to talk to like other collectors, right? Whether they've been doing it for five years or 40 years. Um, and if there's an event at someone's house or they're showing their collection in a museum, go. Uh, even if it's not, again, what you think is like exactly what you want to collect because you're going to take something away from it. And I know we have for sure when we've had those moments, um, you know, so I just want to encourage that because people don't talk about it a lot like that. Art collecting can feel very like a one dimensional, me, 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 I have to like figure it out, but it's so communal. And um, we've been influenced a lot by people in that community. That's my, my two cents. What was, you, what was your response? Yeah, I would, uh, it dovetails with what you're saying. I think practice patience. And it's really something where the, the longer you collect, the longer you are a patron, you start to kind of develop your own eye, your own understanding of the, the space, the artist, the works you like, the things you're drawn to, the conversations that are most interesting. And ultimately, I think the only way you're going to get there is to have patience, not only in being able to explore, like Tina's mentioning, but also in terms of, you know, making some prudent decisions in terms of the art that you actually acquire. Again, I mean, it is it is a financial commitment in that respect. So you do wanna make sure that you're, you're supporting artists and, and buying artwork that you feel comfortable with, whether you're, you're talking your, your own price range or your own sensibility. But I think the only way that you can truly get there is to have some level of patience in terms of how you approach it. And you know, I think for us, that was one of the the, the better parts that we've learned over time. Mm -hmm. um, you know, not to say that we've been extraordinarily impatient, but I think we do have a couple of very you know, interesting stories very early on where we were probably trying to figure out, what, we're still trying to figure out where we sort of sat and what we wanted to do. But with time, we were able to kind of get past that. And I think we've gotten to a place now where we feel very comfortable you know, as art patrons. And at the same time, we feel very comfortable in the, the types of works and types of artists that we uh, like to support. I think, you know, both of the, what, what both of you said is so important across all levels of the art world. You know, first of all, I think the art world is friendly and communal and showing up and showing your face and getting to know people and reaching out to people is so important. And I think often we feel that there are barriers. I'm not allowed to talk to this person. I'm not allowed to ask this question. I'm not allowed to advocate for myself not allowed to share this story you know art is about expression and you know what you were saying earlier in our conversation rick about you know art really believing that artists are expressing this moment in time i think if we all continue to recognize that continue to express what's going on for us we're we're working with art and artists and creating work for a reason and um if you practice patience and you know you really stick with it and, and remain open. I think so many amazing opportunities arise. So many you meet so many friends. You create amazing connections, and it can just be really fun. 
but also very rewarding. I just wanted to share one little story before we break away or end this, however it goes. Um, just to kind of share how Tina and Rick really just know what they like. So I had a show in Chicago and at the Monique Maloche Gallery. Um, they were both traveling and they both were stopping there at certain points. And, you know, it was like, maybe we'll see you, we really want to see the show. Um, and I was literally working on this one piece in the back and I was like, oh gosh, they're here. I want them to see everything. So I don't know exactly if like a portion of the piece came out and this was a collage piece. And I was like, yeah, and this is going to hang here and this is going to be like this. And then I still have to do all this other stuff. And they were like, yeah, we want that piece. And I was like, oh, okay, great. And so that piece was not completed in the show. It looked like it was, but like they mentioned, like my attention to detail, I still had to do this like treatment of clear gel over every little checker the pattern that was in the piece. And so it had to get shipped back to me first and that, that they finally got it back, but just patience, a lot of the things that they've talked about all in that experience of just like, yeah, they're, they're a solid group of collectors. <laughs> That's a great story because um, we were like randomly in town for like 48 hours, I think, or yeah. something. And we were like racing to get there because we were like, we just got to see it for a minute. The show hadn't even opened and you were finishing and the gallery was just great to let us in. But that piece hangs in our hallway and we love it. And that glaze and what it did to the little boy on the phone, because you can see the tear. I mean, we just like stand in front of it because it's so beautiful. So, but yeah, we have a fond memory of that. Of, but we both knew, like we almost have telepathy you know what I mean of like mm -hmm. oh that's the one like we didn't have we don't have to debate a lot we're like that's it and that was one of those moments even yeah. when it's not finished <laughs> <laughs> thank you guys thank you so much I just want to thank you all for for sharing these stories and sharing your advice and being incredibly generous with your time and Tina and Rick we're so grateful to you for lending the beautiful works of Genevieve's that you have to our exhibition and for continuing to let us extend the show time after time hoping that the community could could witness uh, Genevieve's amazing show. And Genevieve, thank you for everything that you've done for the museum and also the Santa Barbara community. We're so grateful for your generosity as well. And um, we hope that we'll all be able to be physically in community together again soon. So thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, good to see you guys. Take care, everybody. Thank you for joining us. All right. Thanks. Bye now. Bye -bye.